This video has been supported by Skillshare. Well, it's gone. It didn't even leave such a long-lasting imprint in the carpet as it did in my heart. The CNC project was getting out of hand and I had to put it down. I'm so sorry. I had to put it in its own little ground-level workshop where I could continue to add weight mercilessly without worrying about the floor caving in. Personally, I think I've lost weight while doing the entire disassembly and assembly all over again. But I'm really happy with the new location and I'm almost ready to cut my first chips here. But not just yet. Today I just wanted to share a few of my amateurish thoughts on lubrication. <laughs> what? Where did everybody go? Yeah, it doesn't seem like a particularly glamorous topic to talk about at first, does it? But before you leave, let me give you a little preview of the other end of the lubrication spectrum. Wait for it. Isn't that glamorous enough? But a normal type 2 lithium grease, squeezed into the linear rail carriages by a grease press in quantities and intervals recommended by the manufacturer, is the most common and the most correct way of lubricating middle and upper class hobby CNC machines. But in some cases the grease's chemical components can separate and leave only a viscous lithium soap behind. Greases also have a habit of picking up and introducing dirt into places where otherwise only circulating ball bearings are allowed. Not cool greases. Much to the dismay of my bank account, I've developed a taste for the professional stuff. And most of the professional CNC manufacturers are in agreement. Oil lubrication is the way to go. It's much more difficult to do correctly, but if you can pull it off, it's better. The much lower viscosity of the dinosaur squeezings allows them to get everywhere and to lubricate everything much more easily. The oil industry, despicable as it may be, is technologically much more advanced than the type 2 universal lithium grease industry. If you wanted to, you could use a fully synthetic ester based 100 bucks per liter oil. With all the bells and whistles and decades of research in the additives. I went with something a little bit more reasonable than that, or should we call it a little less insane? It took a little bit of digging to find out that both Highwin, the manufacturer of my linear rails, and Steinmeier, the manufacturer of my ball screws, recommend this CLP product, the number being a viscosity related variable to be chosen to suit your expected machine speeds. I think I paid something like 70 euro for 20 liter and that will last forever. If handled reasonably, that is. This choice has a lot of advantages. Like all the exposed steel surfaces will automatically be protected by superfluous oil. But how do we get the stuff to where it's needed? To the 12 linear carriages and the 3 ball screw nuts, I mean. Well, that's where the disadvantages start. This oil is a little bit, but not extremely viscous. The nylon tubing diameter is exactly the same that I want to use in my installation. It's surprisingly difficult to squeeze any meaningful amount through this short pigtail. And in my machine I'm looking at multiple meters going through a drag chain and stuff. Well, no turning back now. Here's an exquisite 30 bar gear pump to make that happen. With an equally exquisite 8 microfarad run capacitor. Before sniping this thing myself on eBay, I've asked the manufacturer if they would like to sponsor a set for some dignified international social media exposure. They didn't even have the time for a quick no sorry, so I guess I'm on my own. 30 bar is an order of magnitude smaller than where respectable hydraulics begin. But it's still a relatively high pressure. Kinda makes you wonder. What if you could 3D print your own short-lived but working gear pumps and hydraulic cylinders? I don't know, just wanted to put that out there. CLP100 has an absolutely nauseating crude oil refinery smell to it. I wouldn't recommend it for dabbling around in.
But I'm actually able to bend with the sea clamp here, which is pretty wild. Anyway, the pump is very nice. It has some clever valves built in to catch any trace of air before it's being sent out. That's crucial because we are going to dispense very small quantities of lubricant. And if all a nicely pretensioned ball screw gets in a day is a bubble of air, then it's going to starve and fail. But it only has one output to feed 15 hungry consumers. We could use a plain old manifold, but then most of the oil would go the way of least resistance. A better way would be the manifold and 15 solenoid valves, to open one output at a time. That would be more controllable, but still the dispensed amount would depend on many more factors than just open time. What I need is even better control over the dispensed lubricant quantity. In particular because my ball screws have these wipers, which wouldn't just let an overdose escape. Instead, the nuts can get completely filled, which would result in unnecessary friction and heat. It's also worth thinking about the original factory grease filling. There are preliminary substances which are compatible with oil. Those just get diluted and flushed out eventually. But by mixing incompatible products, you get transitions and no consistent oil film can form. But that's not really where I wanted this video to go. This is the manifold alternative that solves all the problems of equal distribution all mechanically. It's a progressive valve. It has one input and a theoretically unlimited number of outputs which all receive a precisely guaranteed amount of lubricant every cycle. It is a bit hard to understand this work of sorcery and even harder to explain it. This 360p illustration by Graco Inc. is somehow the best I found. The basic idea is that there are pistons in dual cylinders. To make room for fresh oil from the input port on one side, the piston has to move over and squeeze out a well-known quantity from the other side. There is no elasticity and no variables. If one output is blocked, so is the entire mechanism. The piston diameter sets the lubricant quantity. And by combining differently sized slices, you can construct a progressive valve that suits your machine's lubricant desires precisely. The only electronic component is an optional proximity sensor. It senses when one of the pistons moves over and therefore when one cycle is through. I don't know if these guys can recover from starting out with pistons in random positions, so I'm going to take a look inside the small one which was cheap on eBay. My 16 output stack also came from eBay and it was cheap in comparison to buying a new one. But generally speaking, it was horrendously not cheap. Neither was the pump, the plumbing or the oil. In conclusion, I would say that this stuff is for high reliability, money earning machines. Definitely not for experimental DIY projects. But I had a lot of fun finding out about all this and I hope you found it interesting as well. If not, you can head over to Skillshare and find a lot more interesting things there. It's an online learning community for creators with more than 25,000 classes in design, business and more. A premium membership gives you unlimited access so you can join the classes and communities that are just right for you. Whether you want to fuel your curiosity, creativity or even career, Skillshare is the perfect place to keep you learning and thriving. I don't even have a noteworthy quadcopter, but I liked this drone cinematography class. And especially the fact that other participants are sharing their own creations underneath it. That's such a cool feature that I'd like to see on YouTube at some point. Skillshare is also super affordable, with an annual subscription costing less than $10 a month. Sign up with the link in the description and join more than 7 million creators who are already learning with Skillshare. If you are one of the first 500 to do so, you are also getting 2 months for free. And that's it. Thank you for watching. See you soon with the first CNC chips.